to our special theory that we are doing under task force 5 T20 under the G20 and this year the presidency is with India and that is why we are initiating this series of talks for the next 10 Fridays starting from today we are going to cover different issues under the task force we are going to be covering the multilateral multinational development banks next week we are going to be covering climate finance monetary policy fiscal policy central banking all the issues that task force five are engaged in we'll be covering one every friday to cover this series we are going to have speakers from across the world the best minds on the issue who will bring to us the very best thoughts uh, on contemporary issues that G20 would be benefiting from. In today's webinar series, the same thing is going to happen. As you know, that Foundation for Economic Growth is a think tank based in Delhi, and we have been organizing these webinar series on Fridays for nearly two and a half years now when COVID started. We have been very fortunate. We have had a blend of Indian speakers and speakers from the advanced economies and the Western world. We have had the privilege of two Nobel laureates speaking to us. And I think, as I would put it, three potential Nobel laureates who have spoken to us repeatedly. To take the seminar ahead today, Dr. Arvind Virmani, member of Niti Ayu, former chairman of Foundation for Economic Growth, and the former chief economic advisor government of india and the former executive director at the international monetary fund from 2009 to 2012 is going to be chairing the session today he was earlier the president of the forum for strategic initiatives he has been a mentor to fiki and member of rbi technical advisory committee on monetary policy he was earlier executive director as i have just mentioned at the imf and before that the Chief Economic Advisor, Government of India. He has also served as Principal Advisor Planning Commission. During his tenure, he advised on a host of economic policy reforms through hundreds of policy papers, notes, and committee notes. He has served as Member Telecom Regulatory Authority of India and as Director and Chief Executive of another think tank, Indian Council for Research on International Economic Relations. He has published 35 journal articles, 20 book chapters, and written over 50 other working papers in the areas of macroeconomics, growth and finance, tax reform, international trade and tariffs, international relations, and national security strategy. Our first speaker for the day is Ted Truman. I've had the privilege of meeting him when I was at the IO of the IMF. I've gone to his office, interviewed him, interacted with him. I have very good memories of that. And I think he's a great authority on sovereign wealth funds. When I was doing research at the IMF, the book that he had on the sovereign wealth funds was the sole authoritative work that we could depend upon. Edwin Truman was associated with the Peterson Institute for International Economics from 2001 to 2020. He joined the Institute as a senior fellow and was non-resident senior fellow from July 2030 through December 2020 when he resigned. And he was appointed as a senior fellow of the Mosavar Rahmani Center for Business and Government at Harvard Kennedy School for 2021. Today I see him and I am reminded of my days at the Harvard Kennedy School. Great place to be in. Previously, he has served as Assistant Secretary of the U.S. Treasury for International Affairs from December 1998 to January 2001 and returned as Counselor to the Secretary March to May 29, 2009. He directed the Division of International Finance of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System from 77 to 1998. Ted, you'll be happy to know I have worked in the Central Bank at the Reserve Bank of India from 1984 to 2009. So I have the same uh, central banking experience and almost the same experience like you have. That, that was very thrilling when I read your uh, short series. 
Ted has also been a visiting economics lecturer at Amherst College and a visiting economics professor at Williams College. Uh, to be at Williams College is a dream I would like to really have it fulfilled. He has published on international monetary economics, international debt problems, economic development, and European economic integration. He is the author, co-author, or editor of Sovereign Wealth Funds, which I've mentioned, and very useful book published in 2010. Reforming the IMF for the 21st century, 2006, and that I think is excellent work, and I'm, we are hoping that we are going to listen from him in detail on that. A strategy, uh, the fight against money laundering, 2004, and inflation targeting in the world economy, 2003. Uh, Ted, I do not know uh, what position you have, but you know that inflation targeting uh, has had a really different journey, starting from New Zealand all over the world, and then the IMF once saying what should be and what is the right inflation target. Should it be 2%, should it be 4%, and I'm sure you know all that. So we're going to be uh, looking forward to your views on that. Our second speaker for the day is Paulo Batista Jr. He was there at the IMF both when I was as a senior economist in IO and Dr. Virmani was the ED there. Born in Rio de Janeiro in 1955, economist, he was executive director for Brazil and other countries and the, at the IMF in Washington between 2007 and 2015, and vice president of the new development bank established by the BRICS in Shanghai in 2015 to 2017. Previously, he was special secretary for economic affairs at the Ministry of Planning in 1985-86, during the administration of Jao Sahar and advisor for external debt matters to the Minister of Finance, Dilson Fornaro, in 1986-87. He headed the Center for Monetary Studies and International Economics at the Worker Foundation in Rio de Janeiro from 86 to 89. He was a visiting researcher at the Institute of Advanced Studies at the University of Sao Paulo in 1996-98 and again in 2002-2004. He has been a professor and researcher in Lao Paulo since 1989 and from which he is currently licensed. He is the author of the books Myth and Reality in the Brazilian External Debt, published in 1983, From the International Crisis to the Bra Brazilian Moratorium, 1988, the economy as it is, and oh Brazil, and the international economic recovery and defense of national autonomy, 2005, published by elsewhere. These two speakers are going to enlighten us. With this, I hand over the session to the chairperson of the day, Dr. Arvind Vilmani. Sir, can't hear you. Hello, sir. We can't hear you. I oh, uh, Now that you refresh my memory, uh, I, I uh, the, it's coming back slowly. I think uh, Dr. Truman and I interacted on the quota issue in some of the discussions which we had in Washington. Uh, during the time I was there around 2010 to 2012, because the issue was alive then. Uh, so so I, I'm very glad uh, you joining us. And of course, Paolo was my uh, counterpart ED in the IMF uh, from Brazil, and we interacted a lot almost every week or every month uh, on BRICS and other issues. Uh, but of course, he'll join later. So uh, what I'll do is, uh, as uh, Charan said, I mean, I, I got into these issues in IMF. I'll just give some of the issues that I remember uh, from them, and then we'll, I'm sure, have a pretty comprehensive uh, uh, talk by, uh, by Ted Truman. So very briefly, uh, the MDIs, uh, you know, were set up, the multilateral development institutions, IMF, World Bank, were set up in the pre-war, interwar years. Uh, and uh, they were basically uh, based on 
the power structure, if you will, the economic and financial structures prevailing at that time. Uh, and of course, our argument has been that a lot has changed. You know, it's uh, it's almost a century now uh, since those things were set up. Now, of course, the argument, the counter argument uh, had been that there are formulas and uh, uh, we would just use the formulas uh, to update uh, the shareholding. You know, the voting pattern, the shareholding depends on the share of different countries in these multilateral institutions. And there's generally a formula, uh, which if people are interested, I'm sure uh, Dr. Truman would be better informed on this. I don't really remember it now, but I'll just highlight two or three issues which were important to us in our discussions. Now, of course, uh, the, the most important variable from our perspective and generally from the developing countries was GDP. Uh, and, uh, and the big issue there used to be uh, whether to take GDP in PPP or, or in current dollar terms or some uh, weighted average of those. Uh, the formula, as far as I remember, used to be about 50-50. It used to take give 50% uh, to PP, GDP at PPP and 50% and to current dollar GDP. Now, uh, uh, the, the, the issue, the issue which comes out to be uh, very clear is uh, that the gap between PPP and current dollars is on average higher for the poorer countries than it is for richer countries. So uh, richer, uh, poorer countries generally favor the PPP as 100% uh, because it adjusts for the purchasing power parity and closes this gap between the two. So uh, that used to be uh, a big issue of uh, contention. Uh, of course, in the context of India, and, and, and by the way, I held many meetings along with Paolo actually, uh, he'll join us later uh, with the developing countries to get their views to find out what they did. And we generally used to get uh, support for a higher uh, weightage to PPP. Now, of course, things have kind of changed uh, since that time. That's uh, almost a decade ago. Uh, India, as you all know, is the fifth largest economy and uh, uh, even in current dollar terms. And uh, in the next four or five years, it will become the third largest. So in that sense, uh, it is less urgent for us uh, uh, to change this weighting. But this is just this is an issue which has been there on the table. It still applies to some of the poorer countries. Uh, in, including it also applies to the African countries who are not necessarily all poorer. Uh, the second uh, issue which used to, uh, uh, which is in the formula and there was a lot of contention and debate about it uh, was uh, the, the weight to be given to trade. Now, uh, the argument uh, was that uh, the higher the trade, the more the involvement of the country in the global system, and therefore it should have a higher weight in determining what is done, uh, you know, the rules of the game uh, for, for the, uh, the members of the IMF or World Bank. Uh, one of the issues which I uh, had pointed out then is that uh, EU very conveniently uh, when it uh, wanted individual shares would treat each country uh, within the EU as separate and therefore its trade with other EU countries would count as higher trade. But if uh, it wanted to push its weight as the EU itself, for example, in control of the IMF, uh, you know, in appointing the managing director, uh, it, it would use its weight as the EU as a whole. Uh, for those of you uh, who this is not familiar uh, to, the EU uh, acts as one body as far as tariffs and trade is concerned. That means uh, the members of, I'm simplifying a little bit to give the general uh, listener here an idea that uh, the, the members of the e European Union have surrendered their authority to negotiate on trade matters to the EU Secretariat, so to say. So, if, when it's a, all EU countries have the same tariff, and it is determined between negotiation between the EU uh, and uh, you know other uh, parties, so to say, whether it's US, India, Japan, whatever. So uh, when uh, so. You, the question is, how do you treat trade between the within the intra, uh, you know, within the EU? Uh, so 
because if you net that out, the trade share of every country in the EU falls, and therefore it would have a smaller weight uh, in this uh, trade share, uh, and therefore smaller weight in the shareholding of the IMF and the World Bank. Anyway, that that's the broad issue. I'm sure uh, Mr. Truman will uh, talk more about it. And, and then there were a whole bunch of other miscellaneous, miscellaneous uh, uh, items in in, in the in the formula. Now, uh, I would just mention one or two other issues. Uh, the US share is protected, actually, at least in the IMF, which I dealt with. I I'm not, uh, don't have that detailed the knowledge of the World Bank uh, issue. Uh, and that is in the constitution of the IMF. So, so there's no way to change it without the US agreeing. So uh, when we adjust these shares, the minimum share of US adjusted, so it's all really about what is the share of the next, you know, Japan, Germany, France, India, China? That, that's just to give you a kind of uh, political background. I don't want to speak, now that I'm uh, a member of NITI, I don't want to speak too much about the politics, but that is kind of the background, you know. Japan wants to be number two, uh, China wants to be number two. So that kind of geopolitical issue also plays in the background. Okay, so, so with that background, let me uh, now invite um, uh, Professor Truman, Dr. Truman, to to give us, uh, you know, uh, take as much time as you want because uh, anyway, we have to wait for Paolo to join at eight o'clock. Uh, and the only issue is that perhaps others can ask you questions, make some comments, etc. But within that constraint, uh, please uh, take your time uh, to give us uh, your perspective. Well, thank you, Dr. Ramani. It's good to see you, and it's, I'm pleased to participate in this webinar. I assume I'm coming through. You can hear me, correct? Okay, good. Uh, you, ne you never know with these modern technologies. So it's uh, <laughs> good to talk to you and uh, others uh, who I've known for an uh, uncounted number of years. Uh, I should say, as it's almost obligatory in these days, uh, first, that these views are my own and not those of the U.S. government, or I should say Harvard University, where I, as you said, currently have a perch. Um, uh, we all have to do that these days. Uh, 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 in my view on the basic substance here, the IMF quota reforms are essential to the continuation of the fund as the Central International Monetary Institution. As you said, uh, this is, these institutions were set up at the end of World War II. Uh, I guess my spin is a little different than yours. I think they've been uh, remarkably successful, right? The whole structure has been remarkably successful in promoting prosperity or supporting prosperity and growth over the years. Uh, and it's, uh, and they have evolved, fun, the fund more so, I think, than the, than the bank, but they have evolved. Uh, uh, Maybe not as much as they do. They're pretty uh, a lot of inertia in these institutions. Uh, 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 so, so the quota is the quota question uh, is important. Uh, uh, in part because nothing has been done in this area for a dozen years, uh, and uh, uh, and there really are two issues that you outlined. Uh, the formula itself uh, that is used as the basis for adjusting quotas and and then the how those quotas are adjusted which turns on on uh, effects of voting power in the in the <clears throat> in the fund my concern in this area uh, at, at uh, 10,000 feet is this they say the perfect meaning, uh, fixing the deficient formula uh, should not be the enemy of the good, which would be adopting, updating quota shares for a first time in a dozen years. Uh, now, since I'm known for being uh, somewhat provocative, if not outrageous, I have re recently written a paper uh, about the IMF and the SDR and the International Monetary System. And in that paper, I made a proposal. Uh, um, it relates to this question. 
uh, that the conventionally uh, we have protected the share of the lowest income countries. Uh, and that share was protected in 2010 at 3.2%, if I remember correctly. And uh, and my proposal is to double that share. Uh, I have, I'm under no illusions that this proposal being a, adopted, but as you know, Dr. Romani, you know, those of us who are now in the private sector, uh, it's our job to sort of provoke the, the public sector to think about these kinds of things. And I think this idea has considerable merit. Um, it would provide these countries with larger routine access to IMF funding, and that limits the tendency to loosen access limits in extreme circumstances. So it, it uh, and it also would provide these countries with a larger share of any future SDR allocations not enough really to distort the monetary nature of the SDR, but enough to make the SDR allocations more attractive uh, and useful. Um, so just to get one other thing, continue just for the moment with thoughts on the SDR, I've also proposed an initiation of regular annual SDR allocations, which was envisioned in 1969 when the whole instrument was, was created. I'm old enough to actually remember those things. <laughs> Uh, so, returning to the questions surrounding the 16th view of, of quotas, on the quota formula that you outlined, I have long favored greater emphasis on GDP on either measure. Uh, seems to me, in some sense, 50 50, um, 50 50 is not a bad compromise. I call that the Henry Wallach formula. Henry Wallach formula is if you don't know how many cats and dogs there are in the moon, assume they're an equal number. Uh, uh, and then, as you said, on the question of trade, I agree this, oh, the treatment of trade should be in value added terms rather than gross value terms. Because as you outlined, Dr. Rabani, the latter distorts the formula by double counting intra-industry intra trade, especially in Europe and so forth and so on. Uh, the, some years ago, the late Dick Cooper and I proposed the, this reform and using essentially, you could use, uh, we now uh, use value added data on trade, uh, which is now quite generally much more available than it was. Uh, and that would make this, you could make this adjustment. Uh, and that would be, I think, a bit improvement. Uh, yeah. and then you come to the um, question of the size of any um, of a quota increase, a quota adjustments. Uh, the, the challenge we have is that given this relatively surprising low amount of activity for the fund and the for countries other than those eligible for PRGT windows, uh, it's hard to make a strong case uh, for increasing the overall resources of the fund at this time. Uh, uh, but I think the minimum that should happen is a replacement of the current bilateral borrowing arrangement. So we have three tiers now, the quotas, the quota resources, the NAB, new agent, new agent to borrow, Right, and then these bilateral lending arrangements, and currently only forty-seven percent of the resources of that are lent through the general uh, resources account come from quarter resources. Uh, that's hardly the mark of a quota-based uh, institution. Uh, so, at a minimum, you could replace these borrowing arrangements uh, with quota resources, and that would increase the quota share to sixty-two percent. The Next, uh, most next question is the is the issue of the U.S. quota share. It's not written into the Constitution, Dr. Rabani. <laughs> it wasn't written into the Constitution, or the is that certain certain decisions require an eighty five percent vote, and as long as the United States has a more than fifteen percent share, we can uh, we the United States. I say we because I come from the United States. We can block certain major decisions. Um, 
Uh, and I have a somewhat nuanced position on this. Remember, I'm not speaking for the U.S. government. <laughs> uh, uh, and I've said this for some time, actually. We need to accept that our voting share will eventually drop below 15%. And my personal thinking is if we cannot round up a few extra percentage points of voting power on our side on some big issue, then probably our position is wrong. But there's really no rush to get over do this. And since this is a world of bargaining, uh, there has to be some kind of quid pro quo. Uh, I have long favored a reduction in the combined European voting share, uh, which is almost double the United States share. I think it's about 28 percent, 27, 28 percent, uh, including the UK. Uh, and if you reduce that to the to the size of the U.S. share, that that would free up a lot of quota share, if you want to put it that way, for other countries, including the low income countries, as I proposed. Uh, uh, and I would certainly propose any giving any other country a voting share large enough to block major decisions. That's probably not desirable in an institution like this today. Um, so, where are we today? I'm afraid we're not in a very good place. I am rather bored with the ritualistic language that the IMFC and the G20 uh, 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 articulates on this subject. Last Saturday, at Bangalore, Luro, the G20 finance minister, the central bank governors, I'm going to read what they said. We reiterate our commitment to maintaining a strong and effective global financial safety net with a strong quota based and adequately resourced IMF at its center. We remain committed to revisiting the adequacy of IMF quotas and will continue the process of IMF governance reform under the 16th general review of quotas, including a new quota formula as a guide to be completed by 15 December 2003, not so long from now. My question is, who's fooling whom? <laughs> I'm afraid. My sense is that the probability of agreement by December 15th is substantially less than the probability of the U.S. Congress raising the U.S. debt limit before we default, meaning approximately zero. I really don't know what the problem is, I'm not engaged in this stuff anymore or directly and somewhat distant from it. Uh, I have some hypotheses. One, the US administration is reluctant to agree, to agree to any increase in China's quota. And whatever the numbers are, uh, China's quota would increase substantially from where it was, is now to where it is today. Uh, on, under the current formula. Uh, second possibility, uh, the aspect of this is that we are, the United States is reluctant to re, rival, our reluctance is reinforced by what many see as China's less than forthcoming embracing of the common framework for debt uh, treatments beyond the D, uh, DSSI. A wise friend and colleague to me uh, of mine uh, commented a few weeks ago, the countries covered by the common framework are not systemically important. To move, to, uh, sufficiently systemically important to move the needle off the common framework. And it may take a systemic crisis to invigorate both the common framework and the quota negotiations. And this would not be the first time. My in my professional life, generally, uh, action on quotas and so forth and so on has uh, been triggered by a crisis. I mean, the good example is the 2010 adjustment, which came in the wake of the of the global financial crisis. Uh, second, another hypothesis is that uh, the United States maybe is also reluctant to agree to an adjustment that is likely to be as we put it in Washington, dead on arrival at the U.S. Congress. Uh, so on this feature, the terms of any agreement, should there ever be one, uh, on effectiveness are very important. 
Now, I think that in the World Bank recently, with the most recent capital increase in the World Bank, uh, we did not insist that Congress that 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 that, that would only that, that we had to approve our increase in our share, our quota subscription, our capital subscription, I should say, uh, uh, before the whole thing would go into effect. Each stage, uh, so in effect, we uh, were able to risk losing our our uh, our our voting share uh, for a short period of time. That puts some pressure on the Congress uh, to act. Uh, but, uh, and uh, the bank, the bank is less crucial in this area than we are, than elsewhere. I am generally an optimist on all this, the approach to the quote of box with the topic, but I'm, I'm in touch with reality. And this is just one more hurdle in the negotiations. So I am, I hate to end up on a negative note, <laughs> but I'm not optimistic about the chances of agreement by 15th of, of December. Uh, to do so reaches, requires a sophisticated bargaining on replacing, you know, and Rather than this sort of hand wringing and finger pointing, which I suspect is going on in in forums like the G20 and the IMF board and so forth and so on. Um, earlier in my career, I followed such matters more closely, and sometimes I even helped to structure compromises. But today, I can only express my dismay and disappointment uh, that we seem to be stymied. And thank you, and I'm glad to answer any questions, respond to any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so let me, you know, for those who are not really familiar, there's one or two things which you said. If I'd like to explain to the some of our, you know, students maybe here also. So, uh, you know, what uh, Dr. Truman has said about the size of the quota that determines the size of the lendable resources of the IMF or or the World Bank. So uh, that is of greater. I was giving. The perspective of India, which is no longer a borrower, so from the side of, in a sense, the lenders now, and what the quota size uh, is important for the poorer can countries in the context of what uh, Dr. Truman said, uh, and the size depends on uh, gives the total resources which can be lent by the IMF, and the share of that, the 3.2, which he pointed out for the lowest income countries, if that is increased. To doubled or whatever, or increase somewhat, they would have uh, uh, greater resources that they could use a uh, borrow in a crisis. So that, that's the importance of that part of it. Both the size is important for them, and the share which uh, uh, can go to them. So there are two sides to the quota. I gave you just a side where you vote and decide what to do, which was the bigger countries generally and the who are on the lending side. So that, that's one, just a clarification for the listeners. Uh, and one more small uh, clarification, which we have not taken up. Uh, the, the aspects outside the quota are the management of these two institutions. Again, uh, in, in the period when these were set up, it was kind of divvied up <laughs> that the uh, World Bank would be run by a US nominee and uh, uh, IMF would be run by a EU nominee or European nominee. So, uh, independent of the voting, this decision has been taken and and kind of um, uh, is enforced. Uh, I, I tried to uh, when I was there. I tried as a just as a democratic opening with my other friends, uh, other developing countries, etc., to say, okay, let's have a vote. Doesn't matter. We know the U.S. is going to win. Uh, the vote in in IMF, uh, the uh, World Bank. Uh, uh, sorry, the US will win the World Bank, and because they've already decided, so they have the vote. But I thought, just as a democratic process, let there be a candidate from outside these countries, from developing countries. Uh, I, we put up uh, Mr. Montek Alowalia, who had been at the uh, thing, but that doesn't matter. There, Eventually, we selected a, a Mexican former governor, uh, 
and it was just to introduce democracy unfortunately uh, i that experience was not pleasant because i was marked for <laughs> for the rest of my term in in the us uh, in in the imf as a troublemaker so to say <laughs> you know trouble that democracy is trouble when somebody else stands uh, but when you are criticizing it's a great thing uh, uh, sadly this is true in other areas not just imf but when we talk otherwise but anyway uh, let's leave that. Uh, we are not here to just um, criticize, but just to give the picture to to everybody. And, and of course, uh, yeah, I, I, we take note of, uh, as you said, the the issue of China. I mean, I just hinted at the geopolitics, but clearly that has now become a big issue. Uh, you know that any uh, adjustment will result in a much higher uh, quota for China and perhaps many countries uh, now no longer are comfortable with that. I mean, when I was there, there were many more countries which were willing and just because uh, it was thought that China could be brought into the system uh, for whatever reason, which I don't, I'm not right now, I don't want to go into again because I'm in the government now, uh, but for many reasons, many countries now are not comfortable with that. So, so that issue remains in the kind of background. Okay, so with that, um, uh, uh, Charan uh, or uh, other uh, members, you want to start the question or comments, and then we'll open it up to the. Uh, you 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 both have worked at the IMF, and Ted, you've written about it, and you've been closely watching it because you were in the government as a assistant secretary, and then you were at the Peterson watching IMF so closely. I've always wondered, knowing that there is so much of wisdom, so much of history, economic history in countries like India, how come I always think, how come this was totally ignored? And to my mind, sometimes I get a feeling that if your quota is low or you do not have enough voting strength, even your voice is not heard, even the same voice is not heard. And I have, uh, sir, uh, Mr. Chairman, sir, can I give an illustration? Give an illustration, though I may not fully agree with you, but I, 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 yeah, but please do, yeah. Okay. So, sir, in 1991, India went through a very bad patch, and we had to really beg the IMF. And then, after begging the IMF, you know, we got some, uh, some support, but India set up its own high-level committee on balance of payments, and then came out with a rule that you need an import cover of, say, one year. Now, this is exactly what, had it been followed, Asian crisis would not have taken place. IMF missions had been coming to India all the year. It is only when some trouble happened in Argentina that greenspan Goodity rule was devised, and that was exactly the same. So the point, an illustration that I'm making is, on the wisdom that was there in an emerging country. Secondly, capital controls is another illustration. How can the advanced countries and they have all the voting powers just thrust capital control on countries like India, which are so vulnerable? The third is the inflation targeting. In a, in a young demographic country like India, which is very vulnerable, would inflation targeting be the right approach? And I have used it and pushed it so, sir, my question, given these three illustrations is, why during these years, the voice of these countries, which did not have enough quotas, so badly ignored, and I think at the cost of global growth? So, so th I, I knew you were going to mention capital account. That's why I, I put in the proviso. Well, it happened that I was there and I was influential. Uh, and let me just very briefly tell you, uh, we were very clear, uh, you know, that there were two aspects uh, in capital control which were not there in current call. Uh, for, again, for people who don't know, uh, according to the rules of the IMF, all members have to move towards complete freedom on current account. Uh, that is not so in the capital account. A similar provision was not put in the capital account. So there was a move by the capital exporting countries to have the same rule introduced into the IMF, uh, you know, whatever uh, uh, procedures, requirements, etc. So we opposed it. 
when I was, this is during my uh, time at the IMF. And our, uh, our point was exactly what uh, Dr. Chan Singh is saying, that we agreed that there can be macro reasons which are bad policy, which could create capital account uncertainty. But there were also reasons beyond macro, you know, uh, uh, for uh, sudden stops and starts and, and capital account movements, which could be temporary but devastating. You know, once they take place, if there's a sudden movement in one direction or the other, uh, they can uh, then uh, destroy the macroeconomic itself. So we agreed that the countries must have a, uh, a stable and sustainable macro environment, but countries must be allowed to uh, have temporary restrictions on capital uh, inflows, for example. So one of the things I had argued in India when I was CA was that the better way to, to control is not to control outflows, but to control inflows. I have a paper, by the way, in the Journal of Emerging Market Economies, because nobody could object to that. We restrict because we don't want these sudden flows, outflows, but you, once you allow it to come in, you allow it to go out. So it was logical. It was, uh, you know, it, it could be sold to the, the private capital markets that, okay, if we don't want uh, short-term capital movements, we'll restrict it at the time of entry, not at the time of exit. So if we allow it, you can also take it out freely. So uh, it turns out that we did have a compromise. Uh, you were saying we are not influential. We were able to... Uh, have some effect on that. And basically, because we had logical arguments to it, we were also backed by, for example, Paulo was a big backer of that uh, uh, from Brazil. Brazil was backed us uh, and, and several other countries. So I still remember uh, uh, the, uh, the chief economist, the vice president, you also uh, remember the French, uh, what is his name? My memory is a bit weak. Uh, the chief oh, economist. Huh? Yeah, the oh, MIT. Yeah, uh, French name. I can't remember. Yeah, I'm also forgetting. I still he remember. Wrote the, huh? He wrote the paper on inflation targeting things. Yeah, yeah recently he was in. Uh, yeah, so so I still remember. He he called me. I mean, there was all this discussion, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and he called me for lunch, and I uh, and for a discussion. We had a discussion, as and I said, I'm willing to compromise if you accept uh, this. Uh, certainly, we have no problem about accepting the macro uh, issues which are there. Anyway, so so uh, uh, you are right, though, in, in general, if you look broadly, that is an issue. And part of it has to do with this management uh, issue, which I pointed out that, you know, that um, uh, 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 that because it's so set that uh, there is no challenge or even a, a dissent in a sense is allowed uh, that some of these things become extreme. Uh, anyway, so uh, uh, so sorry, I should let uh, Ted to, uh, comment on it. Please go ahead if you have any observations or uh, comments or disagreements on those. Just, just make me two comments, I think. <clears throat> on the leadership question, you're right. That's how it's evolved. Uh, it is also the case that there has been more democracy or competition in recent years. Uh, 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 not always. It depends a lot on the circumstances. Uh, uh, my view actually is that having observed this over the years, uh, because in the last 20 years or so, uh, there has been uh, alternative candidates put forward at both the bank and the fund. Uh, that has forced uh, the Europeans on the one hand and the United States on the other hand to put forward generally more credible candidates. Uh, so this recent candidate now for the World Bank, uh, a very interesting background. I mean, as you know, is actually uh, is a, I think we call him in the United States, non-resident Indian, since he's an American citizen, but he has Indian uh, background uh, and uh, and even in the case of uh, Christina Lina, Christina Lina at the, at the fund, uh, she's not a typical European, if you want to put it that way. She's from emerging market part of Europe. So uh, 
so there has been change, and I think there has been change uh, most institutions, certainly at the fund, there's been an effort to try to uh, diversify voices. Um, uh, as I said before, there's a lot of inertia in these institutions, so it's not, it, this is not, they're going to have that revolution overnight, but if you look at the fund today, and compare it with uh, 30 years ago, uh, it's quite different, quite different organization in terms of its personnel and so forth and so on and, and various influences. <clears throat> I think one of the interesting areas that you touched on other interest is, is the capital uh, count stuff, capital controls. And uh, 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 where there also has been an, a very interesting evolution. So there was this pressure during the 1990s to to uh, liberalize the capital accounts uh, and write it actually into the articles, um, but there's been a big pushback as you as you acknowledged, uh, and and the and the and the and the the posture of the of the fund is uh, is quite different than it was again 20 years ago. Uh, and uh, now it's a little complicated sometimes, and so they have this cup. But but they, and certainly they certainly accept partly for the reasons you, think for macro prudential reasons, essentially some limits on capital controls. Uh, doesn't mean, by the way, that uh, it seems to me that that's these need to be permanent. Uh, 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 but that's a choice that the country has to make, right? And I think the, the fund in its orthodoxy or semi-orthodoxy has adjusted, adjusted to that. It's also interesting what you said. I mean, there is a tendency in the fund to um, uh, use a kick, co cookie cutter approach to programs and policy advice, advice uh, uh, except when it doesn't. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, an interesting case is where they, uh, is the exchange rate policy. It turned out, you know, they did this study some time ago about the exchange rate policy. It turned out that each each mission had a different message about the exchange rate policy when it went off out to countries or dealing with countries who needed programs and so forth and so on. So, there, in that case, there wasn't any orthodoxy. Uh, 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 so, uh, and an interesting case is the inflation targeting. Inflation targeting initially was very much resisted at the fund. The fund staff hated the idea because it meant changing their whole way of, of setting, formulating programs. Though it's not, obviously, it's not the only uh, framework that you could use. It's useful for many countries. Uh, it certainly is for uh the more developed you are, more developed your financial markets are, your economy is, then the more it's more the more relevant it is essentially to guide the central bank. Uh, but it's not necessarily true for uh, every country. Yeah. So, uh, uh, I, uh, Charan, I just remembered one case, uh, one issue which I lost on. I should mention that also, uh, which was not uh, that, uh, which was on the. Uh, global financial crisis. I had argued strike from the beginning, not for myself, but because uh, I we thought, you know, from our experience, that was the logical and consistent thing that before the IMF lent to these countries, we must ensure that, uh, you know, that uh, the, the, the basically the bottom line being that the private lenders who had lent at higher rates in the expectation of higher risk must take the haircut first, not afterwards, not uh, IMF loans going, the, all the private lenders being paid, and then you, uh, you know, sit around and say, ah, now everybody must take a haircut. So this I had argued very strongly. I wrote three papers. Uh, I talked about it in Canada, I later went to Ireland and, and other places, but this one I lost, uh, they didn't listen despite rational arguments, because again, the politics was too strong. You know, the Europeans and the Americans, uh, because the private lenders were from America and the 
uh, EU, uh, the, this argument was not accepted. And what happened was, well, one or two countries managed to get out of it and uh, anyway be able to pay, but a couple of them, uh, I need not mention, everybody who studied it knows, uh, couldn't. And the haircut had to be given uh, later, uh, which meant that all the ills which I had defined had happened. Uh, and and again, it was partial. And again, I think it had to be given third time for certain countries. Anyway, so uh, uh, your general point is correct uh, that, uh, you know, the, the, the quota share, the voting rights definitely influence what are the kind of arguments which are listened to. It's not a pure, uh, you know, pure academic or a pure uh, rational argument which always carries the day. That, that general point, I agree. But once in a while, we, we did uh, uh, win, as, as I said, but there were others where we didn't. And you mentioned inflation targeting, where we have our own experience, et cetera, and perhaps uh, that has not been uh, fully fed in. Okay, Let, let's, I think before Paolo joins, is, uh, let's quickly uh, take a few questions. Is there anybody? Yes, please. I see your hand, yeah. Uh, I don't see your, yeah, Dr. V. Matthew uh, Courier, yeah, please. Go ahead, unmute. Dr. Korean? Yeah. Yes. Am I audible? Yes. Okay. I have two questions. Uh, yeah. One is, uh, we know that the IMO was constituted in 1944 as a fixed exchange rate system. But in 1971, there was the collapse because the United States of America unilaterally withdrew from that. I think that gave birth to a very important uh, malfunctioning of global finance, that is financial speculation. And now I think this sort of speculative finance is getting dominant over other types of finance. So how, how, how do you view this sort of uh, malignant role of speculative finance in the world? That's number one. Number two, in the post-COVID scenario, we are witnessing a number of countries getting more and more vulnerable, especially countries, near, uh, the neighbors of India, Pakistan, uh, then uh, Sri Lanka, and many, many others. The quota system won't be of any help to them. Uh, they are approaching IMF and also other sources. But how IMF, how IMF is going to help them uh, won't it lead to some sort of a radical restructuring of the global finance? So this okay. problem of right. new thank you. Yes. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, please. So I think on the first question, the role of speculative finance. Uh, uh, this genie, or I guess you would call it the evil genie, is out of the bottle, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure we could do much about it. I mean, the only answer is is the best answer, I think, is that uh, is it to encourage countries to uh, 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 proof themselves, uh, protect themselves ex ante to some of the ex excesses. Uh, uh, but it's not, it's not a, it's not, that's, uh, we don't have much agreement about how to do that. And the forces that on the other side are overwhelming. So, uh, you're right in some sense, uh, uh, the end of the Bretton Woods exchange rate system was caused by uncontrolled capital controls, capital flows. It's hard to imagine today, but it was in my view, uh, and it's become more so. On the question of the fund and, and your neighbors, all right, that's it. I have been distressed that in cases like the most recent one, I know some, a little bit about is Sri Lanka. So Sri Lanka has big problems uh, and the fund is essentially sitting on the program because they can't get the required level of uh, uh, financial assurances, uh, which means in some sense, China won't uh, agree to cut its debt. And so therefore the fund is just sitting on its hands. Uh, and I think that's 
I gotta use a strong word, outrageous, right? Uh, 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 I mean, uh, if I were advising Sri Lanka, I know this is recorded, but you know, I, at my age, I can say almost anything and get away with it. Uh, <laughs> um, if I was Sri Lanka, I would Sri Lanka, I would stop paying the, chi the Chinese banks, uh, the uh, banks, and uh, level them in institutions. And and say, well, there's but your financial assurances. I'm not paying them anymore. Give me our program, all right? And uh, let's let's move ahead uh, with this. Uh, well, this program, which will be hard enough for them to implement, uh, but but the you know the waste time and months and so forth and so on and uh, is uh, you know, to tr distract from the whole the whole. Um, effort to get on with the needed reforms in, in Sri Lanka. I don't know enough about the specifics of the case, but clearly I know enough to know that the country, country's economy is in very bad shape and and needs to, uh, uh, a heavy dose of, pardon my words, orthodoxy uh, or move towards orthodoxy. Okay. Yeah. So I, I wanted to add something, but I'll as, just, uh, I'll come back to it later because Paolo has joined. Welcome, Paolo. Good to see you. Uh, <laughs> so, so let, let's turn to him and get, you know, uh, if you can, whatever you want to speak, uh, give a little, because we'll have half an hour left. So whatever, 10, 15 minutes, whatever you want to speak, and then we will continue the discussion. So please go ahead. We, you've already been introduced to the, the listeners. Okay. So you know, waste that time. Thank you, Arvind. I'm glad to be here to discuss IMF quarter reform. Sorry, I couldn't join earlier because of prior commitments. But uh, as you know, uh, I was the executive director for Brazil and other countries between 2007 and 2015. I overlapped with Arvind during his time as ED for India. And I had the opportunity to be in the fund when we made the most progress in terms of quarter reforms. That was during the 2008 and 2010 reforms. I'll, I'll say a little bit about, about what was achieved, what is lacking, and what we can foresee. Um, as you all know, uh, you probably covered this, the role of quotas is central to the IMF because it is a quota-based institution. It's supposed to be a quota-based institution, although it does depart from this principle in, uh, in uh, significant ways in practice. Quotas are central because they are the main determinant of voting power, of access to fund resources, of participation in the allocation of SDRs and other matters. Now, Arvind and I had the privilege to be there when the most important governance reforms, quota and governance reforms in the history of the IMF were, were done. This sounds big, but it's not as big as it, as it sounds because actually, not much had happened, <laughs> almost nothing at all, in the long period between 1947 and 2008, and little has happened since then. So we had this short period, this short window, when we, we could achieve some significant changes in quotas and other governance aspects, which I won't go into because of the limited time, but focusing on, on quotas. What, what, what did we achieve? In the 2008 reform, we achieved a change in the quota formula, which was quite significant. We abandoned a series of complicated and archaic formulas which prevailed up to then, and we had a single quota formula dominated by a GDP blend and with other variables in it. We did some quota shift to emerging market and developing countries and other governance reforms. And in 2010, we continued this in the 2010 reform by doing a further shift in voting power, taking the two reforms together, the shift in, in voting powers to emerging market and developing countries was 5.3 percentage points from advanced to EMDCs. No? And in the 2010 reforms, we approved some forward-looking elements that were quite important at the time. We, we anticipated the next general review of quotas to January 2014, and we agreed to revise the quota formula by January 2013. 
What was the overall goal, goal we had at the time, at least EMDCs? We wanted to transform the IMF into a truly global institution and to cease being what, what Arvin's successor in the board once named a North Atlantic monetary fund, a monetary fund dominated by the North Atlantic countries. We wanted to achieve a very ambitious objective was to transform the fund in a truly global institution where countries would be represented in terms of voting power according to their relative weight in the world economy. Now, this global objective, this ambitious objective failed. It failed because the shift in voting power was modest, and not, not enough to, to change the overall balance in terms of decision making in the institution and worse, the forward-looking elements that we had approved in the 2010 reform were never implemented. There was no actual further change in the quota formula and no review in the quota distribution since then, if I'm not mistaken. And even the implementation of the quotas of the 2010 reform took as much as five years. It was only achieved after I left the fund, six months after I left the fund, by de in December 2015, when finally U.S. Congress uh, approved the reform. Now, wh why did we achieve some progress in the period from 2008 to 2010? I would say very quickly, basically, because we had the Lehman crisis in 2008 with major repercussions, as you know, in the North Atlantic financial system on both sides of the Atlantic. And this made the developed countries a little more amenable to, to change, to discussing changes in the in the IMF and other institutions. And importantly, the, we had support from the United States for changes at the time. I'm talking about the period, the initial period of the Obama administration, where the US threw its weight to some extent in the direction of changes uh, in the fund. Now, this changed subsequently, I believe, Already in my time there, already during the Obama administration, this stance of the U.S. changed, it became less, uh, less prone to, to supporting change. And European resistance to change, which was a major stumbling block we, we faced when we fought for reform in 2008, 2010, and subsequent years, European resistance continued. The basic reason for European resistance is that it's Europe, mostly, that it's largely overrepresented in the IMF. This may have changed in the meantime, but at, during my period there, the US and Japan, for example, were roughly in line with their relative weight in the world economy uh, in, in, in quota and voting power terms. Huh? Now Europe, no, not Europe. Europe was heavily overrepresented in quotas, voting power, and also in other aspects of governance uh, of the fund, which I won't go into now. So Europe was a major stumbling block. When we counted on the US for, for pressuring Europe, we made some progress. But when the US changed stance, then the thing uh, really got complicated and stagnation in terms of US reform, of IMF reform has ensued. So correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm wrong, but um, since the implementation of the 2010 reform after the U.S. Congress approved the new quotas in December 2015, almost nothing at all happened. Nothing at all happened. The forward-looking elements were not uh, were not met. No review of the quota formula was done. No change in the quota formula was done. Uh, no uh, no further increases in quota redistribution were agreed to. And uh, now we have a situation where there's a quota review foreseen for this that needs to be concluded concluded by December this year. I was just looking at this. The, the language in the in the resolution is not bad because it says I'll read it out quickly to you. Um, the, the next the 16th general review quota will be concluded no later than December 15, 2023. And in this context, the executive board is requested to revisit the adequacy of quotas and continue the process of IMF governance reform, including a new quota formula as a guide, ensuring the primary role of 
quotas in IMF resources. Any adjustment continues. Any adjustment in quota shares should be expected to result in increases in the quota shares of dynamic economies in line with their relative positions in the world economy and hence likely in the share of emerging market and developing countries as a whole while protecting the voice and representation of poor, the poorest members. This is not bad language. It could be the basis for our progress. What is the problem? And, and here I conclude. The problem is geopolitical. Since, uh, since we worked on this, Arvind and I and others, eh, the geopolitic, geopolitical climate has changed so substantially. I'm, I'm referring to, of course, the conflicts between US and China, the resistance of the US to face up to the fact that the world is changing, and uh, the role of China is one major concern, the major crisis between Russia and the West over Ukraine. So I, I suspect that, uh, I, may, I hope I'm wrong, I hope I'm wrong, but I suspect that this 16th general quarter view will not be successful in moving forward. I hope this is not true, because if the fund persists in, in resisting to further change, it will be increasingly seen as a Western institution, unchangeably so, dominated by North Atlantic countries, and uh, not really to be trusted as a global institution. And uh, developing countries like Brazil, India, and others will be looking towards other ways of dealing with their problems. Eh? And so I hope this is, I hope I'm wrong, but this is the way I, for, I look into the future based on my experience in the past. Thank you, that's all I had to say. Uh, Karen, do you want to ask a question or should we open? Uh, I think, uh, sir, Ashok Vishwanda is trying to ask a question. Okay, Ashok, uh, try to, yeah, be uh, right. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it was a masterful exposition, Ted and Paul. Uh, just uh, one thing you said this is dominated by the fund is dominated by North Atlantic countries and other thing. So uh, what is the way to have a balance across the countries? Uh, is there any any hope you you have some realistic hope for the reform in the institution so that in a, a 21st century we have a democratic setup that is one broad question. And other thing, which is a relatively minor question, is recently uh, uh, the fund restructuring uh, loan of Pakistan's the prime minister is on record saying that IMF is creating problem for them, those conditionality. And, and he also went on saying that IMF team, when it was a visit to Pakistan, they said they are giving them tough time. Likewise, Sri Lanka has problems. So what do you make uh, out of it? Because uh, uh, never in the past, the country are uh, openly saying they are giving, they, the IMF is giving tough time to them. Uh, Paula, you want to take that? Because we had some discussion earlier. If you have something, yeah. Uh, Ashok, I would say basically that we need, it, we need a new quota formula where the weight of GDP, preferably GDP, PPP, is larger than the current one, which is 50%. Uh, openness and variability are very questionable as, as variables that should include should be included in the quota formula. If you have a quota formula largely based on GDP PPP or a GDP blend, this would go some way into increasing the voting power of emerging market and developing countries. Huh? I would have a further increase in, in, in basic votes to better reflect the positions of smaller countries, of, uh, of developing countries, of poorer countries. And there are other aspects beyond uh, quotas which need to be considered. For example, board composition. Yeah, you have 24 chairs, and uh, the number of European chairs is excessive. And this gives Europe an excessive role in the board discussions. And uh, there are some informal rules that, that would need to be changed if the IMF is going to be a truly global institution. For instance, the informal rule that allows Europe to, de to designate the managing director. Huh? This is uh, something that uh, is antiquated. If, if you want a really truly, truly global institution, the MD should be selected independent of nationality. Huh? 
the board should be more balanced. For example, should we not have a third Sub-Saharan African chair? That might be a change that would be important, or preferably by reducing the number of European chairs instead of by increasing the board. And uh, of course, just a parenthesis here, uh, if, you, if you go towards a third Sub-Saharan African chair, let's not repeat what happened in the World Bank, where the a 25th chair was created, but in a manner in which a few large Sub-Saharan African countries took hold of the chair, not solving the problem, which is excessive number of countries in the, in the Sub-Saharan African chairs. Incidentally, that's a, just one aspect, but basically, I think what I just said is reasonable. I think it's just, it's something we worked on at length, Arvind and I and others, huh? but um, I don't believe that the Europeans and the Americans are willing to really look into this seriously. Because with the increasing conflicts between the US, Europe, and, for example, China and Russia on the other, I think this will paralyze. It has been paralyzing the G20, and I think it will paralyze IMF reform as well, unfortunately. But let's see. I hope I'm wrong, as I said. Sir, can I ask one question? Yeah, yeah, please. So we have, we have, Ted, who worked in the Treasury, and we have two former ED. If this is how, on a global platform, most of the countries, especially now advanced, uh, fast emerging countries are treated, would they not open their own multilateral institutions? And they'll say, we have no faith in IMF. Would it not fragment and uh, destroy the very essence for which these two institutions and United Nations was created. Ted, do you want to respond? Uh, clearly, that's. Uh, I was going to wait for Paolo. Uh, clearly, that's uh, a risk. Uh, and uh, and I, you know, and and uh, thoughtful people should worry about that risk. I think it's. You know, uh, I worry that we're moving, going to move to uh, a world in which, um, in my youth, right, there was the East and the West and the non-aligned, if you want to put it that way. And how these things uh, line up over the next 10 or 15 years, I don't know. Uh, I think there is a role for the important role for uh, a central institution. Uh, uh like the fund and and and, and the world bank and I, I i actually am somewhat encouraged that the the community of development banks um of which uh paulo is now part of uh uh right actually does work together in some sense right so i that that is encouraging i'm not sure how, how well it's done but i but you know if we if we uh you know split things up and the the the, the crude um, the crude point here, I think, is that uh, you need both you need predators as well as people who lend as well as people who borrow running through these institutions, right? So to be an effective institution, you have to have enough uh, countries who are prepared to put up the money, right? Uh, 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 and uh, I mean, they think that's the reality. Uh, and there has to be some, this has to be some uh, a balance. Uh, uh, but I can see the world evolving to, uh, to having uh, parallel and even competitive institutions. And I'm not so sure that the world would be better off with that. And that's why, look, I, I, uh, just to say, um, I think Paolo and I had some different disagreements at one time in the past, but, uh, but I agree 95% uh, with everything he said, right? The United States needs to 
uh, recognize what's here. I mean, we the stuff that was done in 2008 to 2010, I think was was right. He was right. Uh, the uh, Obama administration and my and uh, I was had something to do with this because they're back at the Treasury. It was it was um, very important, and it stalled. And uh, and it's going to take another crisis, I'm afraid, before we uh, get more progress. And let's hope it's a crisis that we can handle rather than a crisis we can't handle. So uh, let me frame the question for Paolo because he worked there also. Uh, you know, when the NDB was formed, uh, there was a hope that it could potentially uh, be the core uh, of a kind of a competitive institution because you had lenders, potential lenders and potential borrowers. Uh, but since then, the fault lines have increased. You mentioned it, you know, that there, there are uh, people talking before you join, you know, uh, Ted had talked about uh, the not mentioned debt trap diplomacy, but Sri Lanka, uh, Sri Lanka's loan from the IMF is not being approved because uh, an arrangement uh, cannot be uh, made with China on, on whatever debt rescheduling. Uh, India, for example, has a lot of debts to Sri Lanka. We have announced uh, that you know they we would be go along with everybody uh, in the rescheduling, but China has not agreed. So uh, in that context or broadly, you think there is a chance of NDB or any other bank being a competitor? And you you work there as vice president, I think. And I mean, um, Ted. Uh, I do believe that uh, there is an ongoing process of fragmentation of the international financial and monetary system because of the reluctance of the Washington-based institutions, the IMF and World Bank, to adjust to the new times and the new realities of the world economy. It's what is happening? I mean, if you look over the last 15 years or so, there was the creation of the Shanghai Initiative, uh, in the monetary field, and the creation of the BRICS Monetary Fund, which is called the Contingent Reserve Arrangement, and in terms of the development banks, the increasing role of national development banks, especially the Chinese ones, and some multilateral development banks created by emerging markets. Uh, Arvind referred to the new development bank, which I helped to create and of which, of, of which I was the vice president for two years. But there was also the Asian is also the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank led by China. What I would say is that, however, being realistic, I wrote a book about the NDB and, and the CRA in English. It's edited by Anthem Press. It's called "The Bricks and the Financing Mechanisms They Created" by Anthem Press. It's in English, so you might want to have a look at it. I made an assessment of what the Bricks achieved. But I would say, looking more broadly, including Chiang Mai, including the AIB, that uh, progress made by emerging markets in the creation of their own institution has been patchy, to be, to be realistic, you know, to be frank. Uh, uh, maybe the AIB. The uh, Paolo, I Sorry. missed the word. What word did you use? Has been? Patchy, patchy. Patchy, right, right, right. Uh, Maybe the AIIB is an exception, but if you look at Chiang Mai, the BRICS CRA, and the New Development Bank, these initiatives have a long way to go. You know, if they are to make uh, the the difference that we creators of the institutions wanted them to be, you know? I was I was working to, towards the CRA and the NDB, you know? and, and you know I only turned to this when I realized that uh, progress in the IMF and the World Bank would be much slower than we expected. The BRICS would never have created a new development bank and the CRA if progress in Washington had been more significant. So this is a result of the paralysis of reform in Washington. But to be again, to be frank, we have a long way to go in terms of creating institutions that are really broad and effective. So this is a big challenge for us in the future.
Okay, thanks. Uh, Charan, do you, there, there's a whole bunch of questions in the chat. Did you pick up one? Maybe we no, should. There are, there are many, but there is some which I can share and then you can decide. Yeah, maybe one person or two we have time for. Yeah. Yeah. So there is one. Also, if we look at quota formula, there are there are the variables which holds less validity in 21st century. For instance, if we look at openness, the debate between GDP, PPP, and and then there is another one uh, that is who will and I think this is a very good question and this uh, refers to the debate which uh, Ted and Paulo just mentioned. Who will be the ultimate beneficiary of reforms? Developed nations or developing nations? Means I think increasingly USA should realize the world is becoming flatter and uh, it is not a one way world. The third okay. question is, can you provide how reforms can resolve on recent debt crisis of several countries? So if three, these three questions you want to take. Yeah, whatever comments you want to yeah, weave around them is fine. Yeah. Uh, Paolo, you want to start or oh, Ted? OK, go ahead, Ted. No, no, Paolo should go first because I've talked a lot. OK, no, please. I just I, I didn't catch the second question. I, I, uh, I'm not I'm not a, able to re respond yeah, to the yeah. third. But the first question on quota formula, this is Please. I think. You want I me to read the, the question again? The second one I didn't catch. Yeah. So the question says that if we look at the quota formula, there are the variables which hold less validity in 21st century. For instance, if we look at openness, the debate between GDP, PPP. So that's the question. It's from Raghav. Yeah, that, that's the one I caught. Well, I would say this. We struggled a lot with this, these matters in the past. And basically, from what I recall from these extensive discussions, I think if you want to have a quota formula that helps the fund become a 21st century institution, we would need to start from the principle of relative weights in the world economy and correct this principle for, for the smaller countries with basic votes. What this means for the quota formula is, in my opinion, doing away with openness and variability and having the quota formula and reserves as well, having the quota formula based on a single variable, which could be a GDP PPP or a GDP PPP, GDP market exchange rate blend and supplement that by an increase in basic votes that would allow smaller countries to be better represented. This is the ideal result, but of course, this will, this will face immense resistance on the part of countries that are overrepresented in terms of their relative weight in the world economy. These are basically the Europeans, with the exception of Spain, if I recall correctly, and uh, some emerging markets are also overrepresented, notably Saudi Arabia. So basically, the basic story is shift from Europeans to EMDCs. That's the, the, the basic mechanism whereby you would make the fund more representative through quota formula changes in the world economy. Okay, yeah, Ted? I agree 100%, actually. I mean, if I, if I could wave a magic wand, I would go to Apollo's uh, GDP only, and uh, you can worry about the blend. Uh, I was just looking at some data. So if you use the current current data, right? For example, the United States on the blend basis has 21%, uh, right? At, in comparison with its, uh, its current uh, uh, Quota share, which is 17%. So it go, would go actually up, right? If you use their system, I don't know whether you like that, uh, but it, uh, 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 and you don't, um, but that would, between where we are and that gives a lot of room to play for increasing quotas of other, other countries uh, for that uh, going forward. And I think your idea of increasing, again, we did some, inc we did increase basic votes some time ago. Uh, but a further increase would be another way to uh, to adjust for the smaller countries. Uh, and I think we need to remember that uh, it isn't only smaller countries that get into trouble. 
Someone earlier referred to the India's uh, IMF program in 1991. I actually had a little bit to do with that uh, uh, from the U.S. perspective. You know, I don't expect India to have a uh, crisis again, but neither did we expect Korea to have a crisis in 1997-98. Uh, so uh, uh, be careful what you look for. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and we all have to keep our things clean. So every country uh, uses the fund. And we like to remember, I always like to remind people that the United States historically has drawn the fund a lot, never with a full program, but uh, it's always been very useful to the United States, even in t as a source of funding. Yeah. So uh, just to, uh, I remember very well, we had organized a bunch of meetings with um, uh, G77 and others, and what a big consensus on, uh, on the GDP formula, GDP only. Uh, Paulo may have forgotten, but uh, you know he didn't attend all the meetings. He was there for some of them uh, because uh, Amar Bhattacharya, who you know, Charan, was helping us organize those because he was doing. He was involved with the G77, so he organized the meeting, and I made presentations at two, three, four meetings and tried to persuade them, and we basically got. Indonesia and others, uh, you know, to uh, understand what we were trying to do because they were used to the old uh, system. But yes, uh, and, and but Paolo is quite right. The big resistance was not from the U.S. Obviously, you can see from the number which Ted has given, <laughs> but from uh, European countries and Saudi Arabia. Uh, absolutely right. That your memory is uh, perfectly correct, <laughs> Paolo. So. Uh, so, uh, there's one uh, question which is more general, you know, the, the, the reason for setting up the IMF was... That Hello! Was Good morning! <laughs> hey, can somebody mute that? I don't know what's going on there. Uh, but... So the reason... So uh, the reason for setting up the IMF was that if there is a crisis in one or more countries, it will kind of blow up and spread to all the others. Uh, so, uh, you know, part of it is a judgment about that uh, beyond what each country is entitled to in any case, uh, and that we've discussed, right, the size of the quota, etc. But uh, so, so there is a balance, right? There is, you're trying to protect the poor. Uh, by doubling their quota, even though it doesn't fit into the formula. A and then uh, you are trying to uh, uh, give a proportionate share to the other countries, just, you know, the, though the probability, as Ted Kite pointed out, I mean, we feel we should never get into a situation where we have to borrow. But, you know, who knows what will happen in 10 years, 20 years, 40 years. Something strange may happen, climate change, uh, you know, some typhoon or whatever. So. Uh, it's the stability of the system, which is the basic argument for IMF. It is not supposed to be what the World Bank is supposed to do, which you, if you have poverty or you got into trouble from some other direction, you know, that you need to be uh, given some uh, relief, etc. But, but it's difficult. I mean, in practice, these things get mixed together. So uh, it's really hard to say who benefits. For example, in the global financial crisis, uh, you could say the Europeans benefited, but I don't know whether Paolo remembers, part of our argument was that it's not the Europeans, but it's the private sector who made the mistake of lending, uh, you know, at higher rates, actually. They had the risk-adjusted rates, which were quite high. Uh, uh, you know, the American and European banks who kind of benefited from these loans. But anyway, uh, things are not always simple, uh, but, but the basic idea is to keep the overall system stable. I'm just answering this general question, which was who benefits. Okay. Uh, we we'll have to. Uh, are there ki any kind of uh, Charan, Do you have time for a last question, or should we go into uh, concluding comments, if any? Sir, I think uh, there's a question from. I think double question. Yeah. Uh, same thing. Who yeah, will be the? We are eight thirty. We've had a long one, so. Yeah, we have a long. We'll... Question. We'll take it otherwise. Yeah, I think I think we'll close. Uh, this question is yeah. about again ultimate beneficiary of reforms yeah, and i think it should be seen as mutual but it yeah. seems it's not seen as mutual and as ted mentioned it uh, and then paulo also concluded saying that uh, 
the two new banks have a long way to go. Shamma yeah. initiative was totally killed. I think it is the money who has the money that runs the mayor. So it's something like that. And I think we've got the fair idea of what's happening on the global. Right. Planet. So, so uh, that's right. So in some sense, you have to appeal to the people who have the power because the alternative is not so easy. You know, it's easy to talk about it. And Paolo, I, I didn't know as much as he does his work there that uh, his words were the success has been patchy. It's not an easy thing. And now with the uh, extra fault lines, which are now very big, uh, with Russia, China, etc., uh, uh, things are even more difficult. Um, uh, unless Paolo and Ted, you want to just add any anything else? We'll conclude the. Okay. I, I want to thank you very much. It's been very enjoyable uh, to participate in this, and good luck to your program. Thank you. I'd also, like to, I'd also like to thank you. It was a pleasure after so many years to, to, to see Ted and Arvind again. Yeah. And I hope we keep in touch. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Your, your voice is still uh, rings in my ears, though. Obviously, physically, we both aged. <laughs> but your voice <laughs> is still very clear. <laughs> thank you. Good. Thank you for coming. Okay, but you know that from, from IEO, I used to meet all of you and see you, but I could instantly recognize Ted. Follow, I could instantly recognize you as you put on the camera. And I'm so happy that after nearly ten years, yeah, uh, ten all years. of you look all of you look familiar. I must thank you, and firstly, I must thank the chair, Dr. Arvind Virmani. He's in a very important, busy schedule in India, but he spared the time to chair the session. I must thank Dr. Virmani to suggest to get Paulo because he said Paulo would be a great fit in this scheme of things. I'm also thankful to Ted who readily agreed uh, to be part of this engagement and was flexible with the time. The recording of today's uh, program will be available by noon tomorrow. I will make sure that you all get it. And I think it's a very relevant one. Ted, as you promised, you could share it with your friends um, and I'm sure they'll benefit and many others will benefit from the discussion. I think it has been a very unbiased professional discussion. Many will benefit. I think people sitting in the IMF would also benefit from this. As I mentioned in the beginning, we are doing a 10 uh, webinars. Today was the first. The next one is on the World Bank quotas and World Bank reform. Next Friday, depending on the audience and the speaker, but I think it will be 6 to 7.30 or 7 to 8.30, exactly like it was today. I would invite all of you to be part of it, be uh, participants, and listen to the discussion, and please come and enrich the discussion. With that, once again, let me conclude and th thank each one of you for being with us. Have a great weekend. Bye. Bye.